Dear friends in Jesus Christ, in the sermon today, we're going to do an overview of Abraham. Now, even though Abraham lived about 4,000 years ago, let's understand that Abraham is looked upon with great significance by the religions of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. If we think about the number of people who live in the world, and we think about those three religions, those three religions would make up over half of all the people in the world. So over half of all the people in the world are looking back to Abraham with great significance. So we should know more about Abraham. If you think about the timeline there I put in your service folder, it's a little bit difficult to read maybe. I am going to give you a little bit bigger version of it next week in Bible class, but you can kind of look at it, and I want you to see there the significance of Abraham's life. His story covers 15 chapters in the Bible. That's a big section of the Bible for one person. So he should be known by us. He should be significant to us. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you some highlights of the life of Abraham today, and then I want to try to entice you to come to my Bible class beginning next week where we're going to take a look at the life of Abraham in a special way. I'll tell you a little bit more at the end of the sermon today about that. For now, though, I want to look at some highlights. So keep in mind with Abraham, now his name was Abram, and then the Lord changed his name to Abraham later on. So I might use the names a little bit here interchangeably, but understand though he had one name and then God did change it to another name. First of all, I wanna mention how Abram grew up with false gods. In other words, I'm saying he grew up in a home where they did not know the true God. Many are doing that today in the world. The Bible tells us, Joshua said to all the people of Israel, from ancient times, your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. When people grow up as unbelievers, many times they stay unbelievers, but that was not the case here. So by the grace of God, Abram did not continue in that kind of a situation. What about people today? We live in a world today where many people are worshiping various false gods. Now, I'm going to go through a little list of false gods, and you might say, well, pastor, those aren't gods. Well, understand anything or anyone that we put before the one true God those people or things have become our gods. So many people today are worshiping the gods of sleep, sports, food, sex, money. I mean, you can go on and on and on. That's the kind of world we live in where all of those kinds of things are much more important than the one true God. Think about the awesomeness of God that I read about in the Old Testament reading today, and yet people are saying, oh no, that God is not important to me. These other things are more important. Well, people are in that situation. Maybe you and I were in that same situation at one point too, but what is the good news though? Through Jesus, Forgiveness is available for anyone who is putting anything before the one true God. God is saying, repent and believe and receive the fullness of my forgiveness. And then going on here, the Lord called Abram to leave his gods, leave his family, and leave his home. Now keep in mind, when the Lord called Abram to do such things, he was 75 years old. When people are that age, they're kind of settled, and they're in a particular place, they're in a particular routine, and they're not going to be doing something radical in their lives at that time. But at 75, this is what the Lord asked Abram to do. Now he encouraged him, he enticed him, we might say, by promising him land and descendants and blessings. 
Now, you have to keep in mind at 75 years old, we don't know all the details here about Abram, but he very possibly has been married at this point, maybe even for 60 years. They've been trying to have children. That was the natural thing to do. Like in the world today, people are like, well, we're married, but we don't want to have children. That would be completely unheard of a long time ago. Everyone wanted to have children. So they probably tried and tried and tried for decades, and yet they couldn't have children. God wasn't permitting it. And now the Lord is saying, oh, Abram, if you leave all of that, I'm going to give you descendants. That means you have to have children in order to have descendants. So he was really enticing him with some really great blessings. And also, too, what else did the Lord say to Abram? He said, if you follow my commands, I'm going to bless the entire world through you. How is that so? That's because the Lord would bring the very promised Messiah into the world as a descendant of Abraham. So these were great things he was promising. And then we see a situation where Abram and Lot. So keep in mind, Abram, he's born there in Ur, in southern Iraq. And then him and his family, they moved to Haran, which is further north. And it's there that the Lord called Abram to leave. So when he left, it was Abram, it was his wife Sarai, and it was his nephew Lot. Now, it was the three of them specifically, but there were probably a number of other people with them, different servants and so on that were with them. So they left, and what happened, like the Lord said to Abram, I will bless you. The Lord did bless them because not that long afterward, they had so many people that were in their households and they had so much livestock between the two of them they couldn't even function together it was too much so finally they agreed and they said we need to go our separate ways so what ended up happening is that they're standing up on a mountain and they're overlooking the valley and Abram he says to Lot he says well you pick if you want to go to the right or to the left, and then I'll go the opposite way. So he gave Lot the choice, and what did Lot do? Lot chose the location of Sodom. Now, why would he choose that place? When they look down over the valley there, understand that the area of Sodom, the ground there was lush. The Bible actually relates Sodom to being like the Garden of Eden. So it was a wonderful, wonderful place as far as the, the content of the ground. But the Bible also tells us that the people living in the area of Sodom, they were exceedingly evil. That's the place so that Lot chose. What about for us? What about for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren? Do all of us sometimes make horrible decisions? This was a horrible decision that Lot made to choose that area of Sodom, but he did it though. I think for us and for our relatives, we've also made horrible decisions, but what is the Lord saying to us? If we have done that, and if we haven't repented already, he is calling us to repent. What does that mean? He's calling us to admit our sins and to be sorry for them. He's calling us to turn from those sins, to stop going in that direction, and to trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. These things are so very important for all people. For us, we should keep doing those things over and over again. And for people who are outside the kingdom of God, God is calling them to initially do such things and then continue in such things. I want to share with you a little bit of a story here about Abram when he defeated four kings. Now, it sounds spectacular, and really it was in many ways, but when they talk about a king, sometimes early on in the Bible, they're not talking about a king over a country, but they're talking more about a king 
over a city or maybe a small group of cities. Nonetheless, so these are significant people with a lot of people under them. If you think about Sodom back at that time, we believe Sodom may have had about 60,000 people living in Sodom. So if you think about forming an army from 60,000 people, you could come up with a pretty substantial army for that day and time. Well, here's what happened in the Bible. So there are four kings, and they get together and decide they're going to attack five other kings. Among the five was the king of Sodom. So the battle takes place, and the four end up defeating the five. When they did that, now keep in mind, Lot and his family, they are living in Sodom. So when these four kings def defeat the five, whenever you would have a victory back at that time, you're going to take many people as slaves. You're going to take all the spoils, all the things that are good. You're going to take all of that. So that's what happened. So all of the spoils, all of the people, they were taken, and then they head to the north. Well, finally, Abram finds out what ha has happened now to his nephew Lot. So Abram, now he has a very large family. God has blessed him. And the Bible tells us that within his family, he had 318 men in his family who were of fighting age. Now, these were not soldiers. These were shepherds. But what do they do, though? They grab whatever weapons they can find, and the 318 of them go after the four kings and all the people and all the spoils they have taken. And with the blessing of the Almighty God, they overcome them, they defeat them, and they rescue Lot and his family and all of their possessions. So that's just a little bit of a glimpse into the kind of blessings that God was giving to Abraham. God wants us to have blessings too. And when we turn from our sins and when we honor him in our lives, he wants to shower his blessings upon us. And then when we think about Abraham, he displayed great faith. So from the time he was 75 years old, when the Lord said, I will give you descendants. And if we kind of set aside the story of Ishmael for now, so he said, I will give you descendants. And now 24 years later, him and Sarah have not yet had a child. That's a long time, isn't it? Hey, you're already 75. Now you're up into your 90s. You still don't have a child. You're thinking, Lord, what's going on here? Did Abraham... Did he waver in his trust in the Lord? Amazingly, he did not. He did not waver. He stood firm. What did he understand? He understood that when the Lord makes a promise, he's going to keep his promise. This is a great lesson for us. Have you ever had some difficulty in your life and you know of a particular promise that God has made that applies to your difficulty, and yet you're thinking, Lord, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. Why haven't you fulfilled that promise yet for me? I mean, we can easily get into that. If we really thought, all of us could probably come up with a list of things that would fit that kind of a category. But what does the Lord want us to know? He wants us to know whatever is going on with us, he is aware, he will definitely keep his promises, and he will do it according to his timetable, not according to our timetable. And he will do not what we want, but he will do what is best. So he is saying, trust me, be patient, don't give up, and I will come through. He did that for Abram. He'll do that for us as well. And then we go to the topic of Sodom. And the Bible tells us that Abram, he looked upon Sodom and he saw it burning like a furnace. Thinking about the passage here in chapter 19, it says, Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. What is that talking about? The place 
where he stood before the Lord, keep in mind now, the Lord had come to Abram and they had a conversation with each other. And remember how Abram was saying, Lord, if there are 50 believers in Sodom, will you spare Sodom? And then he worked his way all the way down to 10. So he's haggling with the Lord. Well, it seems that now Abram's at the same location where he haggled with the Lord. So it says, went to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of of a furnace. Maybe Abram's wondering, I wonder if there are actually 10 in Sodom. Well, he got the answer when he saw Sodom burning like a furnace. We might ask, why did the Lord bring such intense destruction upon this beautiful, fertile area, maybe the most fertile area in the world? Why did he do that? Let's understand he did it because of the grave sin of homosexuality. That is why he did it. He wants us to know it's a very serious matter. Have you ever seen a situation where someone is out of line and someone else makes an example out of that person? Now, maybe you're thinking back to your own childhood when I say that. Maybe you're back in school, and it's early on in the school year, and you do something in the classroom you're not supposed to be doing, and wow, does that teacher come down upon you. So heavy, and you're like, I didn't do anything like that bad, did I? But the teacher like comes down on you so strongly. Why would the teacher do that? The teacher is making a, an example out of you. The teacher wants to set the playing field early on and say, this kind of behavior is not going to be tolerated in my classroom, so don't do what this person did or you're going to be in big trouble. That's what's going on here with Sodom. The Lord was saying, this is a horrible thing. Homosexuality is an abomination to the Almighty God. It's a very serious matter. So the Lord said, I'm gonna make a huge issue out of this, and I want the entire world to hear about it. I want the entire world to remember it and to never forget it. And for a long time, that was true. But what has happened, though, in more recent centuries, it has been forgotten. And in our current day and age, it's almost been completely forgotten. And now, if we think about the last 70 years, we went, if you go back 70 years ago, in America, less than 1% of people were identifying as what we might call LGBTQ. Today, among the younger generation in America, 28% are identifying as LGBTQ. Why is that? Part of it is because the laws of our land have changed. And many people in our country today, they don't worship the true God, they worship the government. So when the government says, this is okay, this is legal, then they take that to be somehow okay, so that opens the door. And then, how many church bodies are getting on board with this whole thing? And even though the Bible is crystal clear, many church bodies are saying, it's okay, go for it. That's where we get that huge increase from the young people. They don't even know their right hand from their left hand. It's a sad situation. We're not here to condemn anyone, but we are here to help people understand the truth so that they might have their eyes opened, they might be sorry for their sins, and they might receive God's forgiveness in Christ. Sometimes we think some sins, oh, that sin is so huge, God's forgiveness won't even work for that sin. That's not true. 
the only sin that will not be forgiven is the rejection of the Holy Spirit. Why is that the only unforgivable sin? Because it is only through the work of the Holy Spirit that we can know Jesus Christ the Savior. If we reject the Holy Spirit, then there's no way to be in Christ. But understand though, when Jesus was on the cross, every sin of homosexuality, of abortion, of murder, all of that was put on Jesus. He paid the penalty. So that means for all those sins, forgiveness is available. What's important, God wants people to understand what is sin in his sight that's all laid out in the Bible, and then he wants people to repent. So we pray that for anyone who's caught in this, that they would have their eyes open, that they would repent, and wouldn't that be wonderful if we had half of our church were people who were brought out of grave sin, and now they're with us here as our brothers and sisters in Christ. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing? Well, I'm almost done here. One more thing. So the sacrifice of Isaac, that's such a huge thing. So Abraham, think about it. He waited 25 years. Finally, him and Sarah have their first son together after 25 years. And then when Isaac is about 15 years old, we would guess, going from the time God promised the descendant 40 years later, now we have Isaac, 15 years old, and the Lord says, Abraham, I'm commanding you, take your son, your only son, travel to Mount Moriah, and offer him there as a sacrifice. It's truly an overwhelming thing. Like, we could read the Bible and probably not really think through what's going on in that situation, but it was overwhelming though. I'm not going to finish that story, but what I want to do though is I want to advertise what I have coming up starting next week in Bible class. So there is a movie that came out about a year ago, and the name of the movie is His Only Son. So it's talking about the life of Abraham but of course, it's pointing ahead to God's only son as well. But with the movie, though, his only son, uh, honestly, it's a little bit of a lower production movie, but I think it's a beautiful movie on the life of Abraham. So I worked this past week, and I wrote a Bible study based on that movie, and the Bible study is in 16 parts. So what that means is, as we get into the Bible study next week, I'm going to give you a little summary of what's coming up in the movie. We're going to look at what the Bible says about that part of the movie. Then we're going to watch maybe 10 minutes of the movie. But we're going to do that 16 times. It's probably going to take us about six weeks or so to get through the study. But with the movie, though, what you're going to find, I think all of you are going to discover that there are things about Abraham that he endured that even though it, it's in the Bible, we're not talking about things that are not in the Bible, it's all in the Bible, but through the movie, God brings Abraham to life, and we can understand more about who he was and what he endured, and these things can be faith-building things for you and me. So I'm excited to share it with you. I hope you'll come. Of course, we gather on Saturdays at 3 o'clock, Sundays at 10.30. Anyway, I hope you come and, and find out more. Well, with that said, let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for saving Abraham and then for blessing him and countless people through him, especially as you brought your only son into this world through his descendants. As we understand the incredible faith of Abraham in your promises and in your son, 
Grant us that same incredible faith that we are trusting in you and in your promises without wavering, and we have complete confidence in Christ alone, understanding that through him we have your forgiveness, we have the gift of eternal life, and so much more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.